Yeah, hello everyone. That will be a really hard act to follow after so many great talks today. So, but I hope I will give you also a nice insight into what I call the bioinformatics revolution. And the bioinformatics revolution we already see, because we have had over the last years seen the analysis of genomes of humans and pathogens, especially in the pandemic. Um, we heard already about better imaging and detection at hospitals. We heard about long-term um, observations of individuals and digitalizations of such observations. Wearables, we just heard a great talk about that. And, uh, and we will later on hear a great talk about an artificial intelligence, about AlphaFold. Um, and my area is more involved with dealing with the large-scale measurements and analysis of proteins and small molecules and how to analyze this data and put that into context. And all of that has together uh, the feature that really the data is in the middle of everything now. So if you look now at a scientific publication, it gives a snapshot of the data which was gathered and the analysis you can do. The data was at this time gathered for a certain purpose. But very often, we have now that this data is repurposed in different contexts where the original um, creators of the data sets have never thought about. And that uh, becomes really crucial. And also, data becomes now crucial in our health. Uh, we heard already great examples. We are moving forward from having these approaches of omics and bioinformatics in the, clin uh, in the uh, research setting to more of a clinical setting. So the data analysis in the, in the health setting will help us hopefully to make early diagnosis, more precise diagnosis, more effective treatment, fewer adverse reactions uh, and prognostics and preventive approaches. And for, for all of that, to help with that, we need to have bioinformatics because all of these technologies create incredible amounts of data and we need to uh, figure out what it means. Bioinf Bioinformatics is still a relatively new field and a diverse field. It builds the interface between computer science and biology and really aims to develop methods and software tools for understanding biological data, in particular uh, large and complex omics data sets. And one of the newest examples you will later on hear uh, about the Human Cell Atlas. So, in driven um, is this revolution of bioinformatics really b with the development of omics technologies. We heard already a bit about that. It's genomics, it's proteomics, transcriptomics, metabolomics, and there are a lot of other omics, and especially the Snyder Lab uh, is driving that a lot into other omics too. Um, so that there's another thing which is really important, which made a huge difference in moving uh, all of these omics technologies and bioinformatics in a way that it was driving the development of molecular biology, of biology, of life sciences, and nowadays also of clinical research and very soon even more of healthcare. And that is one of the reasons for that is what you have in molecular biology an open data uh, cycle. So scientists generate data based on uh, their experiments and make discoveries, but they deposit then their data latest at the time of publication with places like us, Emerald EBI. And we then archive this, but not only this, we share it with global collaborators and all scientists in the world, actually with everyone interested, because all of this data is open. We classify, enrich, combine and analyze the data. We distribute both the raw and the so-called value-added data resources. Again, this is then uh, used by scientists to come up with new hypotheses, design new experiments based on the shared global knowledge, and the cycle starts again. When I started in the late 80s in this field, there we had around 400 users in, in the whole world who were using our data, and we shipped it on big tapes to them. Nowadays, we have hun more than 100 million daily web requests to our uh, websites from more than 40 million different uh, internet protocol addresses per year. Every five minutes, an article is published which cites Amble EBI data resources. And we receive every three seconds a new data set. For that, we need right now something like 400, 500 petabytes of, of disks. So this is really a huge change. But I still think this is only the beginning, because we are now moving out of the research space into the application space. 
So if you look at this map behind me there, then the red dots show all the countries which have clinical research cohorts. That means uh, in these cohorts, um, a whole genome sequencing project has been started. So all of these cohorts, all the individuals get sequenced. That's still clinical research. The more interesting is are the green colors, because that are all the countries which have now already initiated or are planning a healthcare-based whole genome sequencing project, Medic real medical genomes for diagnostics and therapeutics. And again, uh, bioinformatics and the omics technologies are central in, in analyzing, uh, in, in driving this, this forward. So I will give you one example from the UK, uh, based on the Genomics England experience. Genomics England is uh, part of the national health system and is doing whole genome sequencing mainly of uh, uh, children with rare diseases and of ca cancer patients. So there are around 600,000 births a year in the UK and 2% of the, um, the children present with a suspected genetic congenital uh, phenotype where genome sequencing is then approved within six months of birth. So this is standard practice, yeah? So I'm not saying that is tomorrow, that is now, really now. That means you have around 12,000 uh, uh, probands per year. And since you usually sequence not only the child, but also both parents, if and sometimes not both, pa both parents are not available. So you talk about something like 25,000 genomes per year. And the, for in 25 to 30 percent of these cases, you can make now a diagnosis which you couldn't have done without sequencing. And that is having an, an immense, immense impact. The diagnosis leads to 50 percent less hospital visits on average, 25 percent of the time immediate change of clinical practice, in 5% of the patients, it has really a large transformative impact on care. There are also these effects that the families are now able to make better informed choices for future uh, uh, children. Because one of the surprising results was that a lot of these mutations were not inherited. They were, uh, they were happening de novo. And that means when the, ch when the parents have planned another child, there's very uh, little chance that this would happen again. And then there's also the psychological effect that families and uh, the patients and clinicians have closure of that because they don't need to carry on with the odyssey of, of uh, visiting one doctor after the other for, uh, um, for uh, diagnosis and, and, um, and treatment. There is also the side effect, which is incredibly important, that 85% of the families or, pa or patients consent to use the data for ongoing research. That helps them directly, because by reanalysis of the cohorts, in the light of new knowledge, may give additional diagnosis uh, of the ones which were not diagnosed, or better diagnosis of the ones which were diagnosed. And they can be also contacted for, uh, to for uh, participating in trials and clinical studies. So that sounds great. Why, why, where's the problem? Uh, yeah, there are still some problems. There are quite a few challenges to roll things out uh, globally. So one thing are technical challenges. And then I give you one, one simple example. Let's say you are a researcher and you're interested in bowel disease. And you want to find all the data sets out there which are uh, patient-based and uh, in, in databases, yeah? Where you can get access to. First, how do you find them, yeah? So that's already one problem, the discovery. Then if you find them, you find 50 data sets in 30 databases in 20 countries. How do you authenticate yourself? How do you get authorization by all the different data access committees? And if you have all of that, then you can't just download the data. You need to bring your analysis tools to the data. And all of them, or many of them, have different setups. So you need to massage then the data before you can do something with it. And there's one group, one yeah, huge group of community, the so-called Global Alliance for Genomics and Health, both academics and industry, which work together on open standards to solve all of these problems. And I think here we are in really good shape because we have a community effort which works and is shaping the, the, the open standards of the future. 
But there are also other challenges. There are some global and some country-specific challenges. There are the challenges of the pricing. There's a, a lot of ch a huge challenges, how we tr build trust to patients, how to discuss the right of benefit b versus the right of privacy. How do we educate um, uh, people? How do we do the right outreach to raise awareness and show the benefits of what's in there for precision medicine, genomic medicine? We have a lack of infrastructure, of shared open infrastructure. We, have, we are t attacking with the Global Alliance of Genomics and Health already standards and QA and such things, but we also need a lot of people. We need skills, we need more training. Um, and now I think comes really the most important thing. As I mentioned before, the success of modern biology is driven by the open data ethos. And in the healthcare system, you have a very close data mentality. And that drives costs and speed uh, well, it drives cost and slows speed. So I think this is something we need to change. There are also some country-specific challenges, but we can overcome them, like different approaches on regulations, ethics, the different trust in companies versus the state. We heard that already today before. And of course, here we all speak English in the research setting. This is not the case in the healthcare setting. There are local languages. Again, you need to have standard vocabulary, which uh, uh, translates the national form of um, a language into a global uh, um, uh, system which is open, that we can all use it without paying license fees. All of that, and there are many, many more uh, uh, things to talk about, but I really want to stop there and just say we all need to work together on these things. We all need to work together to build trust in the communities. We all need to raise awareness and show the benefits of open data for the society and the individual. I think we all need to cooperate globally on infrastructure standards and skills. We need to federate systems globally while respecting that there are different approaches on regulation and ethics. We will not change that. We want to make it also not only useful for rich countries. A lot of what we talked about here can happen in rich countries, but how do we make that available worldwide? And how do we embed that in a different approach to healthcare, that we look at a one health approach. It's not only humans, it's animal health and it's biodiversity, the environment, that all fits together and works together. And we can't have just a reductionist view there, we need to have a global view. And I think all of us can be part of making that happen. Thank you very much.